Hello everybody, my name is Daniel Connell and I will give you a brief introduction to the integrated simulation and visualization for flood management. I am the lead rendering engine developer for Wisdom, a decision support system for flood management that you can see here. This is a serious application used by experts to prevent flooding, but a lot of the technology we use for rendering and interaction is borrowed from video games. So in this talk I will give you an overview of our flood simulation and rendering and highlight some similarities and differences to games. In order to prevent flooding, we need to predict where the flooding is happening, which is done by simulation. In this scenario, the eastern part of the city would be heavily flooded, causing severe damages. To prevent this, we can now test flood mitigation measures. We first create a new scenario in our system, which is an alternate timeline in which we can change boundary conditions for the simulation. We will first try to create a mobile flood wall along the river, which we select from the menu of available protection measures. We can now draw the wall onto the scene with the mouse, which creates a wall boundary for the simulation that we can modify afterwards if needed. We can now immediately run a new simulation for this scenario to see how well the flood wall protects the city. As you can see, it protects the previously flooded part to the east, but now this part is flooded, which was previously safe, so we need to refine our strategy. In a third scenario, we now additionally create a retention basin, which is an area that can be safely flooded without causing any damages. This is realized in the system by simply lowering the terrain. When we simulate this scenario, the retention basin takes up a lot of water from the river, which prevents the river from overflowing its banks. And you can see that there is almost no flooding inside the city. We can now directly compare the outcomes of the scenarios by navigating through the different timelines manually. We also offer automatic aggregation and plotting of simulation results, such as the accumulated building damages over all scenarios. Domain experts then use this information to decide on the best mitigation strategy. For this workflow, interactivity is crucial. Not only do we need real-time rendering, we also need faster-than-real-time simulation, so that ideas can be tested out immediately without breaking the workflow. So our time constraints are similar to those in games, but our priorities are quite different. Above all, our visual output has to be accurate because decisions of flood managers will be based on it. This means the rendering has to be insightful and without misleading artifacts. And it also means that for the simulation, it is not enough to be plausible. It has to be realistic. So how does the simulation look? A lot of you know particle-based fluid simulation from games. The problem with particles is that they are relatively expensive to update, which means that the simulation does not scale well. For example, to cover a simulation area of 100 square kilometers, we would need tens of billions of particles, which is orders of magnitude more than GPUs can process right now. The alternative is grid-based simulation which simplifies the update of the simulation to the interaction between direct neighbors. Here we have the choice between unstructured and structured grids. Both have their pros and cons, but the main advantage of structured grids is that the neighborhood of a cell is implicitly given, whereas an unstructured grid requires explicit adjacency information. This makes a structured grid ideal for GPU processing and is significantly faster than triangle meshes, which is why we use it. To set up the simulation, we need input data from external sources. The first input is a digital elevation model defined on the simulation grid with a cell size usually between half a meter and five meters. Second, we need the meshes of buildings and flood protection structures. They provide a geographic context for orientation within the scene, but more importantly, we rasterize them on the simulation grid to create wall boundaries for the simulation, meaning cells that cannot be flooded. Additionally, we use two-dimensional vector data in the form of polygons and lines that contain land use information, such as parks, forests, and streets. 
they also help with orientation in the scene. To display them, we triangulate and extrude the shapes and render them into a stencil buffer. In a second pass, we can then check the containment of each terrain fragment in the volumes with the set fail algorithm used for shadow volumes. We also use the land use data to distribute a bit of vegetation in the scene for decoration, and we derive a surface roughness for the simulation, which influences how fast water can flow across a surface. And finally, we add simulation parameters like inflow and outflow conditions or precipitation rates that we get as functions over time. These can be either set up manually or imported from historic events, live sensor data, or prognosis services. Once we have all input, we can start simulating. Our simulation is a 2D shallow water simulation using the finite volume method and is implemented in CUDA. It has an explicit state for each time step, so we always go from an initial state to a new state, which we then render and use as the initial state for the next time step. Each state holds a water depth and velocities for each cell. In the first step, we apply all given boundary conditions to this state, for example reflecting flows at walls and adding and removing water at in and out flows. The next step is the computation of fluxes in the initial state. Fluxes are a description of the mass and momentum exchange between cells. This corresponds to integrating the partial derivatives at the interface centers shown in red. So this step gives us a vector field of the water flow at the cell interfaces. We can now integrate this flow information over time to advance our initial state by a time increment delta t in terms of scenario time. In our application, this is usually a few seconds or minutes, but if you simulate a scenario progressing in real time, then you would advance by the time passed since the last frame. This results in a new state, and ideally we could now exit the simulation and pass on the result for rendering. However, this is not enough if we want a stable and mass-conserving simulation. In the flux computation, we only compute fluxes between two neighboring cells. But if we have high velocities, water could travel further than just one cell within the given time delta t, so we would lose track of some water. To prevent this, we have to reduce the time increment, such that water with the highest flow velocity only travels until the next cell which is called the CFL condition. So we again advance the simulation state, but only by the compute time increment delta t hat. Now we have a new simulation state, but it is not necessarily at the right time step. So we need to use the result as input for another iteration and loop until we reach the desired time step. It is important to realize that for a mass conserving simulation, the time resolution is not a parameter that you can tweak for performance or accuracy. You can only increase the performance by reducing the spatial resolution, meaning increasing the cell size. The accuracy can also be increased with second-order time integration by a convex average over the fluxes of two subsequent time steps. First-order time integration, as I have shown you, is faster but diverges from the ground truth quite fast. It will give you plausible results and is probably enough for games, but for reliable results we use second-order integration. Once the simulation has finished, we pass on the results to the rendering module. The results include water depths relative to the terrain and two-dimensional flow velocities, as well as the terrain itself. For the water, we store three floats per cell. For our largest projects, this amounts to over 4 gigabytes of simulation data that change every time step. To reduce the size of the data, we optionally resample them on a quad tree. Having grid-based data in general makes rendering quite challenging, because we need to reconstruct a continuous surface from the discrete values by interpolation. And we need to do this in real time every time the simulation data change. We start rendering by grouping cells in chunks and emit 
two triangles per chunk containing at least one cell with water in it. We adaptively tessellate this coarse triangulation with a tessellation shader, and then we need to sample the height of the vertices on the reconstructed water surface and determine the visibility of each fragment. The straightforward way to do this is with bilinear interpolation. However, this results in a quite unnatural water appearance with perfectly straight and angular shorelines. To get smoother shorelines, bicubic interpolation can be used. With this interpolation, we get a really nice shoreline with little computational overhead. But as mentioned, our simulation data are often resampled on a quad tree. In this case, we cannot simply perform a bicubic interpolation because we don't have all the neighbors. Four cells in this neighborhood are actually covered by one cell of a coarser level. Our solution to this problem is to perform two separate interpolations that we then blend together. If we look at the underlying quadri, we can interpret this as a set of sparse regular grids. For example, this would be the sparse regular grid of the fine level with only the shaded cells having actual values. And this would be the grid of the coarse level. Within each of these regular grids, interpolation can be performed efficiently again once within the fine level grid and once within the coarse level grid. This gives us two values at the same sample position that we can blend together to a final result. The problem is, of course, that we don't have these values because this part of the grid is covered by fine level cells. What we can do is downsample these values by averaging to compute the center values we want. And with these downsampled values, we can perform bicubic interpolation on the coarse level. Likewise, on the fine level, we are missing values in the top right quadrant covered by a coarse level cell. In this case, we can upsample the values of the coarse level at the desired positions. Once we have upsampled values at all four positions, we can also perform bicubic interpolation on the fine level. Since the reconstructed values are needed several times during one frame, we cache them in a sparse texture and update them with compute shaders whenever the simulation data change. Now we have two interpolation results for the same position that we need to blend together. For this, we first define a weight function around the level transition. The weight function is chosen such that it is 1 at the center of fine level cells and zero in coarse cells where values had to be upsampled. Within all transition regions, the final value is now computed as a convex combination of the fine and coarse values with the calculated weight. And within the regular regions, the final value is equivalent to regular bicubic interpolation. The result is then a smooth C1 continuous surface. We use this interpolation for height field rendering but I'm sure there are also other use cases in games where you need to sample within quadrees or octrees. I made a shader toy of this technique, so you can play around if you are interested. Until now, I have assumed that each cell holds a value that can be interpolated. For water levels, however, this is not true. In flood simulation data, there is usually a distinction between wet and dry cells, and for dry cells, the water level equals the terrain level. Let's look at this in one dimension. Here we have terrain values given at the cell centers and linear interpolation in between. Now, water levels are only given for wet cells, but not for dry cells like the one with the red diamond. Here we assume the terrain level, which leads to a climbing artifact. This happens at all slopes along the shoreline and gives a really wrong impression of the water propagation. The opposite happens at walls. Here, the water surface dives down when approaching a wall. The reason is again that a wall cell is a dry cell in the simulation and has no water level. If we assume the terrain level here, we will interpolate the water surface straight to the ground. What we actually want is a continuation of the water level based on the assumption that the water surface is locally flat. And we achieve this by extrapolating the values of neighboring wet cells. 
So for this dry cell, we average the water level of all neighboring wet cells and use this average for interpolation. With this extrapolation, we can fix climbing artifacts at slopes as well as diving artifacts at walls. One artifact that remains at walls is leaking. The problem here is that uh, the interpolation is oblivious to high resolution boundary conditions such as the wall geometry. So the water surface is just interpolated through the wall. We fix this with the per fragment operation that we apply to all fragments within dry cells shaded in red here. First, for each fragment, we mirror its position across the wall. We then calculate an interpolated wetness value, which is 1 in wet cells and 0 in dry cells. We compare the wetness values at the two positions, and if the value is higher at the mirror position, the current fragment is on the dry side of the wall, and so we discard it. This test allows us to reliably remove this leaking artifact at runtime. And finally, we are able to render our terrain and simulation data without many artifacts in 10 to 20 milliseconds. What I haven't talked about yet is the shading of the water surface. If you look at this video, I believe you have no problem to see in which direction the water is going, because there is a visible shoreline that you can follow. But if the area is already inundated, it is much harder to see where the water is going, which is an important information for the design of flood protection structures. So we use the water surface as a display for flow properties, for which we use exaggerated waves and foam. We start with the water's 2D velocity field, which we get from the simulation. We subdivide the spatial domain into tiles, over which we calculate an average velocity. In each tile, we then define a sine wave oriented towards the average flow direction with a wavelength corresponding to the tile size. To hide the seams at tile borders, we do this for four partially overlapping tiles that we then blend together. And we do this for five different tile sizes and wavelengths and sum up the results to a wave weight that you can see here. We use this wave weight to displace the vertices of the water surface in a geometry shader, which results in animated waves that make it easier to identify flow directions. This wave synthesis is inspired by two techniques used in many games. The superposition of wave functions is commonly used for open waters, which produces very realistic waves, but is not very good at depicting local flows. For local flows, like rivers, tile-based approaches are often used, which rely on texture advection of pre-computed wave patterns. Using wave textures is fast, but imposes some limitations and leads to obvious repetitions on the water surface. By using wave functions in different sized tiles, we can avoid these problems. Finally, we apply some foam to the surface. Here we use the wave weights again, and at regions where the velocity field's gradient field has high magnitudes, which emphasizes turbulence. We use the result of this as a foam weight to modulate the visibility of a cellular noise function, which produces a procedural bubble pattern. We apply this function with the calculated visibility to the water surface, and with the waves and foam added, I think it should be no problem to identify the flow directions anymore. The shading also automatically adds foam at regions of high velocity, like at this flood wall breach, and indicates when the flow velocity decreases. Apart from waves and foam, we apply further shading effects adopted from games to provide a subtle hint about the water depth, namely a depth-dependent box blurring of reflections with the help of a summed area table, and exponential transfer functions for opacity and color. And finally, we add screen space reflections for a bit more visual quality. This concludes my presentation, and I thank you for your attention.